Everybody, we are going to call this fleet and area Joint Study Committee on Dual Enrollment for Highly Skilled Talent at Younger Ages. We're going to call this meeting to order. I want to welcome everyone to Albany, Georgia. Albany, if you're from here. Um, I would like to first recognize the state senator for this area, my good friend, Senator Freddie Powell Sims. Uh, senator Powell Sims, if you would like to grab this mic and kind of welcome everybody and maybe uh, start us off with a with a prayer. Good morning, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Albany, Georgia. If you have not been here before, uh, we are certainly excited to be able to host you. Now, um, Senator Brass knows that I'm not a name dropper, but I'm dropping names this morning, okay? <laughs> Senator Brass is one of my dear friends in the Senate and has been for a very long time, so I'm excited to have him here. Um, I asked him early on, as well as the Lieutenant Governor, if they would come to Southwest Georgia to take a look at us and see what's going on. And they said yes, so more to come. Um, also, and, and I want to do that, I, I'm just going to name drop him because he is my friend. But Southwest Georgia is immensely honored to have legislative leaders from across this great state of Georgia gather for the express benefit of our children, of our children. Good morning, Elena, how are you? This gathering represents the epitome of educational experts seeking economic solutions for the future of Georgia and our children. And you'll hear me say children a lot of times, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, what you will hear and see today will intensely promote educational career pathways for students. And when this committee has completed its work, it will have strengthened Georgia's workforce for every sector of our economy. Just remember that. Now, would you please bow your heads. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, 58th verse. And now, thank you so much. And now I would like to just mention a few things about our uh, fearless leader. And I want to name drop uh, Senator Elena Parent. She is my leader in the House, I mean in the Senate. I'm sorry, I was a House member at one time. <laughs> Oh no, oh no. Um, so good morning, Elena, and welcome to Albany. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Senator Brass represents District 28. I hope this is the right information since, uh, I hope it's been updated. Uh, his committee memberships, and I'm going to tell you that he is chairman of rules. And those of us that don't know what rules is, that committee chairmanship, it is probably the most important position you can have in the Capitol. He determines what bills are going to, to get heard out of the Senate or let out of the, uh, the committee. And if you, okay, so much for that. But anyway, <laughs> this is a very coveted chairmanship. It is at the top of everything. He's a part of regulated industries and utilities. Children and Families, he's the Secretary, Education and Youth, ex officio, Health and Human Services, a member of that committee, Natural Resources and the Environment, ex officio, Administrative Affairs, he's also a member, and he was sworn into Georgia Senate January the 9th, 2017. You have to understand that there are 56 of us only in the Senate, so we end up with a lot of committees. Um, and we serve extremely well. And I'm just gonna pat, pat myself on the back and all these other senators that are here 
because it's, it can be very grueling sometimes, but we do a great job. So those are the things that I wanted to say. Again, welcome to Albany, Georgia. Please, if, there, if there's anything that we can do for you other than fixing a ticket, we can't do that. That's called illegal. Um, please let us know and welcome again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. All right, so this is a joint study committee. So this is House and Senate. And um, I've got my good friend here, Representative Matt Dubnik from Gainesville. And we're going to, he's, he's got a, a little bit of history with, with education. He chaired the education committee for two, two sessions and chaired, now chairs the uh, appropriations on education for the House. So very important role. Um, very passionate about what he does, very passionate about kids, and we all, you know, we're all very passionate about workforce and making sure that our talent is staying here in Georgia. And so, you know, the, the whole point of, of this study committee, um, and, and this is my challenge to, to each of y'all, and um, you know, we're going to challenge this committee to look at state policy that allows more dual enrollment programs to workforce development systems so that we are developing more highly skilled talent at younger ages. Like we've, we've been getting it right for a long time and we're about to make it better. Um, so to today's specific meeting, uh, we're going to focus on the needs of the health health care workforce. And we wanted to come down here to Albany to really highlight what they're doing here at the College and Career Academy, the partnership with Phoebe, um, and it's just they are getting it right. You know, I, I just left Phoebe touring it, and, and you look at the things they're doing around workforce and training the kids, and, and I say kids, I mean, there's y'all aren't kids, um, <laughs> but just training the talent, and it's, it's very, very impressive. And, you know, we, we, it's a challenge to each of us as legislators. You know, we talk about rural Georgia and what are, what are the needs, and, and one of the number one needs that always comes in, up year in and year out is workforce. You know, how do we attract talent to come to rural parts of the state? And riding around Albany, you, you, see, you see how you do it. Um, and we're going to highlight that today. Um, before we get into that, we're going to introduce our committee members. And I'm going kick it, to kick it here to Representative Dubnik, let him uh, introduce himself. And, and then we'll just kind of, I guess, pass it down and let everybody introduce yourselves, where you're from. Uh, who you represent, and then we'll get 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 kicking. So appreciate all y'all being here, and um, this is we're going to unofficially call this the Matt and Matt Road Show. Um, <laughs> we are starting here. Uh, the next meeting will be in Noonan, where uh, where I feel like our College and Career Academy uh, we are getting it right as well, and it's more of a focus around manufacturing. And so we're going to see how dual enrollment is used in different industries and how we get it right. And again, challenging this committee to figure out how are we going to do it better. And so with that, again, thank you all. And uh, just honored to serve alongside my good friend here, Matt. So we'll, we'll see if we can find anybody else to join the Matt caucus before we leave. <laughs> Uh, but again, as Senator Brass said, my, my name is Matt Dubnik. I'm from Gainesville. I'm in my seventh year in the House. And, and my joke was with Speaker Ralston when he called a few years ago and said, I'm going to ask you a question. I need you to say yes. I said, well, could you tell me the question first? He said, no. <laughs> and there was this long, awkward pause. And I said, OK, I'll say yes. And he said, I need you to chair the Education Committee. I said, well, I, my only experience with K-12 education is that I survived at one time. <laughs> and he said, well, you, you're going to learn a lot. Just, just hold on. And man, what the, what the last three years have taught me and shown me and, and the passion for, for education that I didn't know that I, that I had. But there's 1.8 million students and 11 million Georgians who are counting on us. And that's the collective us in this room to get it right. And I think Senator Brass said it best. Someone asked me yesterday, 
I was saying I had to be here for the study committee, and they said, dual enrollment, I thought that was a very successful program. What are, what are you all trying to mess up? Mm -hmm. I said, no, it's quite the opposite. And Senator Brass said it best. We're, we're simply trying to take a, a, a good program and make it even better. And, and I hope that, that you will all take his challenge very seriously and keep that in mind, that, that we're not trying to fix something that's broken. We're just trying to put more oil in the machine. So I'll, I'll pass this down. Uh, two, two people that I'd like to recognize, Representative Stacy Evans, who uh, will join us in future meetings, couldn't be here today uh, from Atlanta, but as, as Representative Ballard and I were just talking about, she is a, a, a wealth of knowledge, and if you haven't had the chance to talk to her about education, I, I hope you will. And, and then to my good friend from Sylvester, Representative Yerda, thank you so much for being here and, uh, and, and gracing us with your presence. And, and, and I got to work hand in hand with him, and I'll give him this shout out, and I'll pass the microphone over. That last year, two years ago, time all runs together when, when this man came to me very passionately with some legislation uh, around, around some educational topics, uh, financial literacy, and we talked about things like civics and civics engagement. And he was so patient to understand the process, but he just kept saying, but I'm, I'm doing this because the, the youth need to understand what it is that we can help to do to prepare them to walk across this planet and in their life's journey. So thank you for that passion and, and being true to that and, and for helping me learn a lot about that process as well. So again, we'll, we'll pass the microphone down if you don't mind telling us who you are, where you're from, and, and as Senator Brass said, who, who you're here on behalf of. I'm uh, Bethany Ballard, and I represent House District 147, which is Warner Robins and Centerville. I am a freshman legislator. I survived my very first session, and I'm on the Education Committee and the Defense and Veterans Affairs Committee and Special Rules, and I am here so that we can make sure that all of our students, whether they're you know, whatever they're going to do in life, they are successful and that Georgia remains successful. Good morning. I'm Jill Oldham and I am the governor's appointee. I am currently living in Rockdale County. I'm a 32 and a half year retired educator. I was on the upbringing up committee for the Rockdale Career Academy and that's where I finished my journey. Um, I've been working with dual enrollment since 1994 in all facets. So I actually look forward to this. I love putting out new opportunities for kids. Good morning. Art Recesso, Vice Chancellor for Academic Innovation for the University System, Board of Regents. Um, my priority in, in my unit is talent demand, talent development. Uh, we have the Georgia FinTech Academy, the Georgia Film Academy, Healthcare Prep, um, Data Science Collaborative, all our priorities uh, among others w within our unit and uh, very happy to be here and, and, and support this work. Good morning. My name is Tiffany Taylor. I'm Deputy Superintendent of Policy, Flexibility and External Affairs with the Georgia Department of Education. I'm here this morning on behalf of State School Superintendent Richard Woods. Um, as you know, it is the first couple of weeks of school, and so he is um, traveling at a variety of different schools throughout the state, so he apologizes that he could not be here on today. Um, however, on behalf of Superintendent Woods, uh, a key priority of his for the department and our mission is to prepare students for life. Um, and he is constantly um, reiterating and preaching to us that that means that whatever path that students are uh, determined or decide that they wish to take um, upon graduation, that they have the ability and are prepared to do so. And so we see this as also a critical component of supporting that mission and vision. Good morning, Joshua Stevens, Georgia Department of Economic Development. I was born and raised in Gainesville, Georgia, live in Peachtree Corners, and uh, serving on behalf of Commissioner Wilson from the Department of Economic Development. So thank you. Good morning, uh, Scott Steiner. Uh, I get to uh, lead the great healthcare organization here in Southwest Georgia, Phoebe Putney Health System. 
Uh, I've made a Senate appointment, and uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, you know, if you'd asked me five years ago, uh, you're going to be a whole lot more involved in the education of your workforce, uh, and uh, I, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Uh, but it, it, it's a different day. It's a different chapter, and we're all, uh, every business uh, uh, is involved in it. And uh, we're excited that we've got so many great partners here in southwest Georgia and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Derek Dubrowiak, Assistant Commissioner of Student Affairs and Secondary Initiatives at the Technical College System of Georgia here on behalf of Commissioner Dozier. Um, so we work with all of our dual enrollment and college and career academies. Just looking forward to how we can better support dual enrollment growth and what this new vision and version may look like going forward. Hi, I'm Rick Townsend. I'm from the coast, Brunswick, St. Simons area. Uh, Educational over 30 years, retired as superintendent, and my claim to fame down there, I ran the, ran the Golden Isles College and Career Academy. It's a great career academy as well, so I understand it. Uh, Chris and his team, they do an amazing job. Mark up in Noonan. First thing I did, first time I traveled when I got to the Golden Isles was to go see Mark. I said, go north. He's the man. He understands it. And uh, that's what it takes. You have to, you have to build relationships. You have to work with the business community. I'm just thankful the business community showed up today and, and really engaged, and that's what it takes. Whether you're in Noonan, Brunswick, uh, Albany, uh, it doesn't matter, but the business community is a key part of this whole process. So I'm just thankful for being here, thankful for being on the committee, and looking forward with such outstanding representatives here and senators. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm Senator Elena Parent from DeKalb County, and um, I'm in my fifth term in the state senate. I do serve on the education and youth committee and I'm very passionate about education and um, the role it shapes in um, determining the future of our state both from a quality of life and um, economic perspective. I think Georgia's done amazing things in the dual enrollment space as our chairman were saying and I think there's actually a whole lot of opportunity that um, I'm hoping that this committee will help unfold for the future and I'm very pleased to be a part of it. And um, Minority Leader Butler should be here any minute. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I'll, I'll add to um, Representative Townsend and Senator Parent actually did a lot of work in helping them pass uh, not only just this, the resolution needed to form this committee, uh, but also to pass Senate Bill 86. And um, this, bill, this study committee kind of goes in conjunction with Senate Bill 86. Senate Bill 86, just a quick highlight of what that does is, um, it, what does it do? I forgot. No. Uh, <laughs> Senate Bill 86, it, it allows the kids in high school to start tapping into the CTAE funding before their 30 hours of, uh, is, that's required. Um, it allows them to tap into that quicker. So um, the idea is to get them certified faster, get them in the workforce faster, and again, this study committee um, is going to make sure that that program is sustainable, and then we're going to figure out what we can do to make it even better. So uh, we just had the minority leader, Gloria Butler, show up. Ms. Butler, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us where you're from. Morning, everyone. Sorry I'm late. Uh, I was parked on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Butler from the cab and Gwinnett Counties represent um, Senate Minority Leader, Democratic Minority Leader. I live in Stone Mountain. That's exactly 200 miles from here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be here. Look forward to uh, learning more about this issue and finding out what it's all about. After being in the legislature for 25 years, this is a new one for me. So thank you, Mr. Mr. President. I want to. <laughs> Don't put that on me. <laughs> All right, and um, not with us today, uh, Senator Rick Williams. And y'all, please keep him in your prayers. Him and his wife Donna. She just had a um, she just had a major operation, and so he couldn't be with us. I think that was two days ago. So. Um, she's in recovery, and he's obviously spending time with her, and helping her on the road to recovery. And and then uh, Lynn 
Lynn Riley, our commissioner of finance, or finance commission, um, she, student, I'm sorry, Georgia Student Finance Commissioner, Lynn Riley, she couldn't be with us today either, but uh, she is on the, on the committee, will be joining us as we have our other meetings. And so, and then you had. And then the speaker's appointee is Trey Shepard from Howard Shepard in Sandersville, and he will also be with us in future meetings, but he was the appointee from the speaker's office. All right, now uh, we'll get into the meat of the program here, but before we do, um, when we get done, we're going to have about 20 to 25 minutes for public comment, and for those of you, if, if you wanted to speak and didn't know, we actually have a, a sign-up sheet right back here with Mercedes, so um, if you can just come out and sign that, we'll make sure and get you, get you called up for some public comment, should you choose. You don't have to, don't feel pressure. Um, okay, well with that, uh, why don't you kick us off, get us our panelists going. Well, I see six names and I see five chairs, so I guess this is a little, <laughs> little duck, duck, goose, and, and we'll use the, uh, the podium there. And so, um, Chris, Irene, Pam, Scott, Tracy, and Angie, if you will come join us. I'm assuming I see there. There's a clicker there on the right hand. Yep, you found it. So we'll we'll turn it over and and again for for each of you, if you will, when it comes your time to have a microphone, if you don't mind just introducing yourselves, and and same thing, where you're from, who you represent, what you're here on behalf of, and we'll turn the show over to you. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you, Committee, for being here. Welcome to Albany and welcome to the 4C Academy. We are thrilled to have you all down here. And uh, even though it's a 200-mile drive, we're glad you're here. I know it's a long time to be in the car, but uh, we're, we're just thrilled to have everybody. My name is Chris Hatcher. I'm the CEO of the 4C Academy, and I'm also the chair of the Georgia College and Career Academy and Network. So I'm here really with both of those hats on to talk a little bit about uh, dual enrollment. Um, First, uh, what, what I thought I'd do before we introduce our, our panel, um, just tell you a little bit about the 4C Academy and some of our partnerships here. So um, we're a Georgia College and Career Academy, uh, which means we're in partnership with the Darty County School System, uh, the business community, Albany Technical College, and Albany State University. So those make up our, our partners. Um, we uh, are, are just thrilled to have such a great partnership and honored to uh, and, and fortunate to. Uh, the Darty County School System is our fiduciary, so this building belongs to them. Uh, our uh, uh, staff works for them. Uh, and, we, and again, we, we couldn't have a better partner there. I report to a board of directors that by our charter says that must be a majority business community and nine out of our 11 board members come from the business community so we are a business driven college and career academy um, and so th that's a little bit about it and our mission somebody on here shared it we're all about preparing students for whatever's next some may go directly from high school into the workforce some may go on to albany technical college or albany state university or go away for college but eventually they're going to be in the workforce and so our mission is to prepare all of those kids uh, for a successful uh, and long career uh, in the workforce. What I thought I'd do is just introduce a few of our partners here that are, that are in the audience today, and I'd like to start with Superintendent Kenneth Dyer. Uh, many of you may know Mr. Dyer. He serves on a variety, in a variety of capacities uh, at the state level, uh, but what an innovative leader that we have down here in Albany, and uh, a lot of, uh, it's an awesome charge to have to lead a public school system, and he just does a great job, and we're thrilled to have him. Uh, Dr. Emmett Griswold, uh, he is the president of Albany Technical College, and although he's been there uh, in this capacity for a, sh a relatively short period of time, he's been with Albany Tech for some time and has been a partner of 4C Academy from our start. So both of those gentlemen are my friends and partners, and we're just thrilled to have them as part of our team. Uh, uh, Dr. Griswold has Lisa Harrell, who's Vice President of Academic Affairs, Lisa uh, with him, and Lisa Stevens, who is the Dean of Nursing. She's here as well. And then we have uh, Sarah Brinson, Dr. Brinson with Albany State University. She's with their Darton College of uh, Nursing there, and happy to have you here. Um, our 4C team, we've got Ms. Clark, raise your hand, Nurse Clark, 
And then we've got some of uh, the students that we're talking about today in the back. If y'all would all raise your hand. These are our CNA students. They are, yeah, let's give them a hand. They are all seniors. They all have their CNA certification. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And they're all working uh, for Mr. Steiner and Ms. Suber at Phoebe Putney right now as a paid intern. So uh, uh, we also have members from our business community, Barbara Rivera Holmes. Uh, she is the, the uh, CEO of the Albany Area Chamber of Commerce and is also a regent for the state of Georgia. So Barbara, welcome. And the business community is a strong partner of ours. And then Laura Russ is with her, Laura. And uh, many of you have heard of the entrepreneurship program called FLEX. She helps with our relationship with them. So those are some of our, did I miss anybody out there um, as part of our partners? Jana Dyke was on, from the EDC, is a strong partner too, but she, I think, had another uh, something that came up. So we appreciate this opportunity again to be here and, and, and talk about this important topic. And so what I'd like to do now is just turn it over and have our panel and what I'll do is just lead a panel discussion to tell the story of sort of how we got to, to Senate Bill 86 and found uh, some barriers that we bumped into that ultimately led to this with your uh, blessing to, to allow for this. So we'll just start um, with introductions. Irene, why don't you tell us who you are and who you're with? Great. Thank you so much. I'm Irene Munn. I know so many of you through my time when I was in the Lieutenant Governor's Office for 12 years and worked with all of our college and career academies. So today I've continued that work where I serve too on the board of the Georgia Can Network, our College and Career Academy Network, and assist with um, really policy development and all of that. So that's my role here today. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Pam Clayton with the Georgia Healthcare Association. It's great to be with you all today. Great to see these students here with us. I was actually a, a nursing assistant. I want to date myself because I was a nursing assistant pre-OBRA. So that's when you didn't even have to have an official certification. And I went to the local nursing center and got ready and prepared to work uh, for the day I turned 16. So I was I joined the workforce then. So that's been quite a quite a bit of time ago. Georgia Healthcare Association has a wide presence across the state. We'll talk about that more in just a bit. I work with Seth Coker, uh, Chris Downing, if some of you all are familiar with him. Uh, those guys do great work. And uh, again, just appreciate the opportunity to be here. Good morning. My name is Angie Gardner. I'm the principal here at the Forsey Academy, and I have the honor of serving these lovely students. So thank you. Scott Steiner again. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dr. Tracy Suber, and I'm Vice President of Education for the Health System. I am a registered nurse, and I too, Pam, I worked as a nursing assistant, so been there, done that, and I know a lot of these guys, and so it's just a pleasure to be here today and share a little bit about what we're doing and um, grow from it. All right, well, thank y'all. We've got a great panel for you today to talk about dual enrollment for highly skilled talent at younger ages. So that's the topic here. And I thought we'd start, Irene, with you just telling us a little bit. Uh, you, you've been around for a, a little while. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, just to help us set the stage, a brief history. Let's start with that of college and career academies. I will. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, really, college and career academies got started in 2007. Um, thanks to the influence of the Georgia General Assembly, you guys have always been putting money in the budget to incentivize communities to develop a college and career academy. The original college and career academy was the central Educational Center in Coweta County. Um, he's already been introduced, but Mark Whitlock here today is the CEO of that. And I look forward to going to Coweta County on August the 22nd for y'all to see um, the programs that they're doing there. But the network got started, and today we have 54 academies across our state. Um, I, I, it's wonderful to be able to look at, at Senator Sims, Albany, Rick, you have Golden Isles, Decatur Career Academy, CEC, Hall County Career Academy, Houston Career Academy, and then Rockdale Career Academy. I mean, you guys represent these best practice programs that are in statute <laughs> defined, and it's really what Chris just said. It is secondary, partnered with post-secondary, and the business community 
all coming together to form a workforce pipeline for the region's needs. And that is in statute, that definition is in statute, and I, I want to make sure you heard from our, our friends with the Board of Regents. Everyone, while we are very much tied to the technical college system of Georgia and the influence of that, but there's not a single college and career academy that does not have a university system of Georgia partner that's with them in deciding dual enrollment programming. The other thing that's in statute is the certification process. So every one of our college and career academies are required by law to be certified to ensure that they are best practices and then that certification by the technical college board then goes to the Department of Education and their state board. So as all these school systems ask for flexibility and want to get that flexibility through their contract, whether it's a charter system contract or a strategic waiver contract, they have to, and they're going to say they're doing that with their college and career academy or one of their innovative practices, they have to be certified. So that is really kind of a, a, a a best practice or, or making sure that there's fidelity to the model. So you guys did that. Again, there's 54 academies. You guys funded one more community that's in a grant process right now. So hopefully by December, the Technical College will award 55 academies. And I think it's important, too, that you know that three of those 54 are regional academies. So it's an academy serving more than one school system. We have Griffin region. They have three districts that feed into that academy. We have SECA in the Vidalia area with Southeastern Technical College. And then Southern Pines has three school districts funded um, funneling into that school district. So it really is meant to be a regional model to serve the regional workforce needs. The other thing I want to talk about is really our College and Career Academy network tries to implement programming and then when we run into stumbling blocks, the network comes to you to say, let's rethink about how we're doing our programming and access to um, funding or policy or whatever that is so that we can better serve the workforce needs. That is exactly what happened as it relates to dual enrollment. So let me give you a little bit of a foundation around dual enrollment. Um, you guys passed House Bill 444 in 2020. Um, if you remember prior to that, it was kind of the wild, wild west as it relates to dual enrollment. Any student could choose starting in ninth grade, let's take whatever class dual enrollment wise, and it was just way too much. And what you did on House Bill 444 was strategically and critically important and good job for doing that. And honestly, that policy change made a whole lot of sense because in 2020, your dual enrollment funding was $150. $5 million. In 2024, your budget that you just passed was $76 million. So you, what you did with House Bill 444 is put in a 30-hour cap on dual enrollment. So, and you also said to students that if you're going to do academic dual enrollment, it has to be core academic and it has to be in 11th and 12th grade. Very smart, right thing to do. The other thing you said was if you're going to do technical dual enrollment, it is fine for you to start that in 10th grade. And then Georgia Student Finance, because of the programs like what you're going to see in Coweta County, as well as the Accelerated Career Program, and I'm going to describe that in just a minute so you understand that, but because of those very heavy technical courses that went way beyond 30 hours, Georgia Student Finance said, after you reach your 30-hour cap, you can then begin accessing HOPE grant dollars. Chairman Brass, you just articulated that about technical instruction after that. Well, that was the right thing to do. It was really smart, but 
So the positive things about that was, again, we put parameters around the amount of money that you're investing for dual enrollment. The opportunity that you gave us is why you're here today. And we have found where that choice, where you're really honestly putting kids on this decision making, and you'll see this, and you'll see the decision making as you look at this healthcare pathway. Kids are choosing between academic instruction or technical instruction. And we know both of those are equally important. Nothing is better than the other. They're both equally important. And so we will, um, you're going to learn today one more, one more foundational thing that you need to understand is the two ways a student can graduate from high school. And if you, <clears throat> if you look at this slide and go, I am majorly confused about this, um, join the club. Because <laughs> people literally do not understand um, understand this, but we are working really, really hard to make sure more and more school systems are embracing both of these paths. So there, today, there are two ways to get your high school diploma. One is called the traditional path, and that's the one at the top. That is probably the high school diploma that all of us got. Very all academic, four years of math, four years of science, English, um, social studies. And then all of the other courses are electives. So your CTAE courses are all electives um, within the context of that. And then the other path, this was passed in 20, 2015, y'all passed Senate Bill 2. And that was where you get your basic academic courses, ninth and 10th grade level academics, and then you turn and fully focus on your post-secondary success. Um, it's lots of times Mark Whitlock describes it as you have to finish college to get your high school diploma. And that's exactly what it is. And also in your folder, if you guys will look at this document that's in your folder, this is the Technical College System of Georgia document that is available to you. And you know these are all of the different paths that a student can graduate from high school with their college coursework. So it's very heavy technical in the two TCCs. And the important thing about the two TCCs listed on this document, they're all part of the HOPE career grant list. So they're all high demand, high skill, high wage jobs as it relates to these two TCCs. A student can also get a diploma from the technical college in any technical college program, or they can get an associate degree while they're in high school. And that can be an academic associate degree or a, a associate degree from the technical college. And again, over the next two weeks, or the two meetings, you really are going to see exactly the type of programming we're developing. Today, you're going to hear about a healthcare focus. And that path for these students is under the traditional high school path. Um, August the 22nd in the manufacturing, you're, that, those students are graduating with the accelerated career path. So in dual enrollment, in this document, the, how dual enrollment is funded within both of these is what we're going to talk to you about today. And I think that's enough. Right? That's great. Yeah, thank you, Irene. A lot of information there. And so, you know, again, what we're talking about today with these students is really this traditional diploma. These students ultimately want to go to college uh, to, to further their education. So that's why they've chosen that. Some, you know, we'll learn more about the other pathway uh, next time. So uh, now what we'll do is just kind of back up a little bit and set the stage from a, a workforce demand standpoint. And we're going to ask Pam to just share a little bit about your industry and some of the challenges that you all face from a workforce standpoint. Certainly. Thank you very much. So again, with the Georgia Health Care Association, and we represent post-acute and long-term care. And, uh, you know, really my overarching message today is uh, we want to be a great partner. There's a tremendous need, uh, but there's also great opportunity. And so great opportunity for these students that are here today. We have a tremendous presence across the state of Georgia, uh, very much so in rural areas. We represent uh, about 350 skilled nursing care centers, uh, assisted living providers. Uh, we have associate uh, members, vendors, and ancillary services, labs, et cetera. 
And also we uh, support the home and community-based service model. So when you think about the workplace setting and opportunities and career pathways, I mean, we, we're touching a lot of areas and, and there's a significant economic impact there uh, within our space as well. Uh, so what do we know, and I'm, I'm probably going to share what you all uh, clearly know already, is we have, a, we have a numbers problem. We have in Georgia, we have an aging population, but we also in our space have an aging workforce. And uh, the pipeline simply is not adequate. And that matters because quality of care and quality outcomes matter. And uh, so anytime anyone's seeking care for themselves or their loved ones, they want competent, uh, caring folks there to provide that service. And we, we really have a numbers problem. And um, so we certainly were impacted by the pandemic. And um, we are deeply concerned about our ability to recover from that. But I'll say, and I know we don't like to use the overuse the term crisis, but we had a problem pre-pandemic and with workforce, relative to workforce and numbers, and that certainly intensified, but uh, uh, kind of a message that I want to ensure that I underscore is the ratio of caregiver to consumer is declining at an alarming rate. And so I think that should have the attention of everyone. So when we think about uh, you know, opportunity and what do we need to do, we also need to be thinking about the impact side uh, that really, from a healthcare standpoint, touches everyone. So uh, this is just a, a number, maybe a little bit difficult to see, but this is for the, the state of Georgia, and again, specific to our space. But we lost about 6,000 jobs, 6,000 employees during the pandemic, and we simply have not recovered at the same rate that other uh, settings across the continuum have. We're working hard. Uh, every day feels like maybe there's a little bit of light there, uh, but there's a definite need. And, and so we have opportunity for, uh, you know, those clinical rotations, internships, and employment. Uh, so I think it is important to not just focus on the problem, and I'm, I'm grateful that we're here today to talk about solutions and strategies uh, in terms of how do we confront that. As you all know, workforce is a national conversation. It's uh, you know particularly important and forefront for us right now and the providers that we serve because Number one, we haven't recovered to pre-pandemic levels, not even remotely, but also we're confronted with the potential for mandated staffing minimums through um, the president's executive agenda. And we look for that to drop any minute. So you can imagine how that we're, we're trying to think through, we're, I'm trying to staff today at current expectations and to think about a mandate coming along just any minute is uh, difficult to contemplate. But we're excited about opportunity that uh, House Bill uh, 487 offered related to certification uh, for those individuals that as de determined by the Department of Community Health might allow them to take the, the certification exam and start that pathway maybe to from being a certified nursing assistant to a certified medication aid and then maybe ultimately LPN to RN. Uh, you know, I, I think there's just really a lot of opportunity to think about how can we make that as easy and as barrier free as possible and as seamless as possible uh, so that those students have opportunity to determine what's their passion and what pathway do they want to be on. But they can also, while they're continuing to navigate their education and attain that, uh, they'll have opportunity for employment and it's going to be meeting a tremendous need across the state of Georgia. So we're grateful to be able to be here and, uh, you know, probably just a few miles down the road, there are multiple skilled nursing facilities talking about how are we going to staff today? You know, and we got all those positions filled. And so it's important that we're at the table and really working through this together. So thank you. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate that. Um, sounds like st step one is job security for you all, uh, at least from Pam's perspective. Scott, why don't uh, next you? Why don't you? Uh, that's a great sort of statewide uh, picture. Why don't you paint a local picture and and first tell us a little bit about Phoebe Putney in case folks aren't familiar, and then we'll kind of go into uh, sort of your workforce challenges. Sure. Thanks, Chris. 
You know, it, it, this slide shows you the, the region that we uh, we have the privilege to serve, uh, really here in the, the quarter of the state, in the southwest quarter. Um, we do have, uh, Phoebe's got four hospital campuses. Uh, we've got urgent care centers, primary care centers, physician, uh, specialty physicians, um, a home health agency, a hospice. So we're a full service uh, health care system here in, in southwest Georgia. Uh, we, you know, we see our mission uh, as, in a variety of different ways, but one of them is to create access uh, in in our communities, especially access in, in rural Georgia. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to have the people, right? We, there's no ATMs, there's no healthcare ATMs that you can you can set up. Certainly telemedicine is, has been a new entry, uh, but we saw a great use of telemedicine in uh, during COVID, the early stages of COVID, and it has uh, almost uh, uh, gone back to pre-COVID levels. You know, the, it's the consumers, especially maybe uh, consumers that are 30-something uh, plus aren't ready for that yet, and the uh, younger folks are. Uh, but and so that that hasn't been an answer uh, it, 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 to, to all the needs from a healthcare uh, access standpoint. But that's been our focus uh, is serving this quarter of the state. You know, most uh, healthcare organizations, I think, whether they're hospital system or, or long-term care, if you add it up, we're usually uh, you know outside of large metropolitan areas, the largest employer or one of the top employers. Uh, Phoebe is we are the largest employer here in Southwest Georgia. Big economic impact uh, uh, over almost two billion dollars. Uh, when you look at that, you know, payroll, we provide charity care, about $63 million in true, uh, true charity care each year uh, and, and a good bit of community benefit. The crisis, right, these are just headlines. Uh, it's been around. Uh, Pam talked about it. I've been in healthcare for 30 years. We have always had uh, a staffing uh, issue. Uh, it, it Certainly this is where we're at today. It's, it's never been, uh, the need's never been as great uh, as, as where it is today. And you know, healthcare, no matter if it's in a hospital, a, a physician's office, an urgent care center, a, a long-term care, a skilled nursing, it is still people taking care of people. Uh, I know there's there's robots in healthcare. They're usually in the OR, uh, but it's really not a robot, uh, folks. Just to debunk that, uh, ha human beings have to operate that piece of equipment, and and so we're still human beings taking care of human beings. And and Pam said it: the, the crisis. Uh, uh, we are so short today, uh, and we're all going to need that care, right? And it could be today, it could be next week, it could be in in 20 years, but. Uh, uh, we're going to need it. Here's the, the, the shortages across the country. These numbers change. Uh, I've seen uh, nursing shortages in the United States more than $2 million. Uh, this is just, just one source that it's about 1.1 1, 1 .1 million nurses short today. Uh, and more nurses are retiring every year than are coming into the, the practice. And, and uh, that's just nurses. We, don't, we talk about radiology techs and, and lab techs, and I mean, it's just across the board. Uh, uh, Georgia, uh, it, this recent study has said we'll be 80,000 nurses short uh, by 2030 if we don't turn that around. Uh, Phoebe has about 200 open nursing positions, uh, a little bit more than that, and about 600 overall positions in our region uh, we could use today. So, you know, we think about in southwest Georgia, uh, maybe that's not a big number for Atlanta uh, or some of our more metropolitan areas, but 600 new jobs in southwest Georgia is a big deal. A uh, big deal for our communities. Though. That's 600 people that need a church, that you know, are going to shop at a grocery store, are going to send their kids to school. Uh, that can have a huge impact uh, in, in this part of the world. Uh, just to uh, maybe drive it home a, a little bit more, 50% uh, of all nurses in the United States are over 50. Uh, and, uh, you know, nursing is, my mom was a nurse. Uh, she was an ICU nurse for 25 years. Undoubtedly, why I found my way to healthcare uh, was her influence. And, uh, but it's a demanding job. It's physically, it's mentally, it's emotionally, they are exhausting. Uh, and from that physical standpoint, you know, uh, they're on their feet. Nurses are on their feet uh, all day, eight hour shifts or 12 hour shifts. And so you say, well, they still have 15 years or, or, or to work approximately. Uh, many of them don't make it to 65. And so we, as an industry, we've had to think about how can we extend their careers without the physical demands uh, of that, of, of the job. And uh, Georgia is consistently losing 3.7 percent of its work workforce every year, uh, not being replaced by new graduates. And the the uh, the chart on the right shows this is a, a recent study from the U.S. Nurse uh, Journal uh, comes out of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. If you look at uh, nurses per 1,000 population, 
Uh, Georgia has 7.31. We are 49th in the United States in nurses per 1,000. Uh, and if you said, if we wanted to get to Florida's average, we need 15,000 more nurses. Uh, if we want to get to number one, South Dakota, can you imagine South Dakota's number one? Uh, <laughs> but even if you said Massachusetts, right, uh, we need 56,000 more nurses uh, just to get to that average. The U.S. average, uh, we need 20. So it shows you really how short we are and the work we need to do uh, in, in our state. And I know we can do it. The, the governor's been very supportive. The legislature's been very supportive. Uh, uh, and sometimes people say, well, you got to pay them more. And uh, this it comes again from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Recently, uh, Georgia has the highest pay rate per nurse in the country when you uh, adjust it, a cost of living adjustment, uh, the highest rate. So um, I'm, certainly I represent the employer. It's not to say that our nurses don't uh, deserve more and more. Everyone does. Uh, but it shows that we're being as aggressive as we possibly can be in compensation uh, to, to gain this workforce. Uh, last slide is, is uh, and I talked, I mentioned this to Senator Brass this morning, you know, Phoebe, we pride ourselves on not being complainers. Uh, anybody can just say, hey, this is a problem. Uh, somebody, you know, a uh, uh, governor or, or the Senate or the House or someone else come fix this. Uh, what we've said is we, we're going to be part of this solution. And whether it's putting our people uh, into it, uh, like, like Tracy is, where we're putting our dollars into it, uh, we are going to be part of the solution. Uh, all of our partners, we have many partners here. Um, and, and so, yes, we need to be in the education business. We need to be in the inspiration business. And that's something that we're working on uh, as well. And this, this right here, uh, Dr. Griswold is here. Uh, this is a, uh, we, have, we have relationships, and, and Tracy will talk a little bit about some of our other partners. But this one right here is an investment uh, uh, by Phoebe. A 40, we're making a $43 million investment in a living and learning community. What you're seeing there is a rendering. Uh, this is underway. That it'll be done in, in about 11 months. Uh, and it, uh, Albany Tech will be moving their uh, health sciences uh, uh, courses uh, 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 school over to this facility, about 50,000 square feet of, of, of teaching space, uh, state-of-the-art teaching space, and on the second and third floor would be 80 apartments for the students. Uh, the thought was we really needed to, to make sure we're casting that net far, uh, and, and we wanted to get kids, uh, 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 young students, into uh, an environment where they can live together, uh, they can learn together, they can be inspired together, uh, and so that's what you're seeing there today. Uh, I don't know if it's been done. We didn't sort of scour. It just felt like in the conversations with, with Dr. Parker and Dr. Griswold, uh, we needed to do something. And uh, this was what we, we came out of the shoot with. And, and we were going to put our money where our mouth was and, and try to bring. Uh, this isn't going to solve the problem for the state. Uh, but if, if every health system in the state said we we're going to produce more nurses, I hope they all stay at Phoebe. Uh, I know that, that they won't, but that's OK. Uh, we're here to help uh, our region. We're here to help the state. And uh, uh, we're excited to do this. Thanks, Scott, and that just certainly uh, puts a, a, a microscope on the challenges here. And with, I also serve on the Economic Development Commission here in Albany. And if you were to say, hey, there's a new company coming to town, 200 jobs, because they've got a 200 nursing shortage at an average pay of $70,000, $75,000 salary, we'd, we'd say, wow. And, it, and so it is very important for us as a community to pay attention to those opportunities for our local economy, let alone for our students. So thank you, Scott. Uh, Tracy, let's turn to you and talk a little bit about partnerships. You have been busy over the last several years uh, chasing this. And just talk a little bit about some of your uh, uh, post-secondary partners and partnerships in general. Yeah, so thank you. Um, Scott kind of set it up. Um, as Pam mentioned, we were having this problem before um, before COVID, and so a team of us got together in 2019. Um, Scott led that group, and um, I kind of got tasked with uh, taking kind of taking ownership of that a little bit. Um, I was formerly with USG, I recognized one of my colleagues over there. Um, I was there for 12 years and uh, ended kind of that USG career as assistant dean over the nursing program there. 
And so I kind of had those relationships with many of our academic partners, kind of knew the challenges that schools were up against. And so each one of these partners that are listed on here, I could go through the list and talk about how every relationship has been different. But the goal really was to get more students into the programs. Um, we need all of those students to get in so that they can get out and into the workforce. And so um, every one of these, you know, I could just kind of run down the list. I mean, some, some of these programs and schools, in order to get more nursing students in the pipeline, they needed more faculty. So we provided funding for faculty. Um, some needed clinical rotations. So we, we provided funding for part-time clinical rotations. Um, some told us, which we've heard, I've heard quite a lot, is that math and science is a problem and the nursing students really struggle with that when they get into the program, um, if they get into the program, because of the pre-entrance test to get into nursing. And so um, we funded biology instructors. Um, you know, with some of these programs, um, they had not, like Georgia Southwestern, for example, they didn't have an associate degree program. They had gotten rid of it many, many years ago. They now have started an associate degree program back. Um, Fort Valley State University, it was a brand new program and we, you know, invested in launching that program. Um, going through Lee County, that was a work-based learning program. As I look on here, I probably should add Department of Education, I see Dr. Walls here, um, but, you know, they've been a partner of ours, you know, coming to the table to really look at what we could do in K-12 through to try to help these pathways into these um, programs. Um, and Albany State, you know, Summer STEM Academy, we've just finished our third year and that program had 60 kids out to the STEM Center um, this past summer and um, about 60% of those kids that went through that program said that they had decided, they had decided to go into healthcare because of their experience. That is tremendous. These are ninth through 12th graders that you know, not given an opportunity, you may not know what they, you know, what they don't know. So, you know, it's important to get in front of these young people earlier and expose them to opportunities early on. Um, I could keep going down the list, but um, wonderful uh, partnerships with each one of them. And that leads me to um, 4C, this wonderful space and this wonderful team here. Um, so before COVID, um, it, this is before COVID, you know, we were starting to see some, um, some trouble with some of our um, workforce in terms of the professionalism issues or lack thereof. Um, those essential skills, you know, we say soft skills, but really they're essential. You've got to have it in the workforce. Um, I also work with inpatient um, nurse educators. I am a nurse. I'm close to what, you know, what we're seeing in our workforce, what the challenges are. And, you know, some of the things that we were seeing were tardiness, people just not showing up. Um, you know, not being able to maintain eye contact, um, just a general, sometimes there are appearance, you know, these things. And so we began to have conversations. Uh, that's when I first met Chris, and we came out here and we sat down. Um, another real big one was lack of empathy, um, compassion. You know, if you don't have empathy and compassion, you don't need to be in healthcare. I mean, you know, people are coming to the hospital the majority of time not because they choose to. And so we have to instill those skills very early on and set that foundation um, and expose them to that. And so um, also some things, maybe sk other skills that we might need in the workforce, you know, really sharing that with Chris and with Melissa, you know, telling, telling these teachers and all that we're, we're working with these kids early on, you know, what it was that we needed in the workforce. And they listened. <laughs> And we began to come out here um, to the college and career um, uh, college here and do classes. And we would do things like um, communication. Uh, we'd bring our organizational development team out here, do workshops on communication, on professionalism, um, the patient experience. You know, when I went to nursing school, nobody really talked to me about patient experience. Well, hospitals are judged by it. I mean, we, we need to be exposing these kids early on to what truly is that patient experience like. And so we would come out and, and talk to them about that. Um, diversity, inclusion, equity is huge. Um, it's one of the pillars of our health system. And, you know, we did need to start having conversations early on about that. And so um, we were able to come out and do that. 
pretty much anything. Um, and then um, I know we're going to talk more about the career pathway, but that was definitely a joint partnership and what we wanted to see and being able to um, get these high school students in an internship opportunity um, and what are the challenges. And there were challenges that came up. You know, one of the things we had our health system was wouldn't hire less than 18. I know you probably have heard that across the state. Well, we were like, well, why? Why, why don't we change that? And guess what we did? And so now we're able to bring these younger people in early on. And so um, really having those conversations. Most recently, our newest agreement, we just finished our third agree third year agreement with um, 4C, and we've entered into a new partnership. Um, and that's the story for another day, but it involves medical assistance. But we also are going to be um, funding a half of a position um, for a full-time faculty person. Um, and it will go along more with that um, advanced career option that y'all are going to talk about later that used to be option B. But we didn't want any per, anybody left behind. If those students didn't want to go into nursing school, maybe they want to do something else in the healthcare profession. So how do we hang on to them as well? And so this other position that we're going to have fund at Phoebe will will kind of culture that that uh, that group of students as well. So, did I cover? Yes, that? thank you, Tracy. Time? An incredible partner that we have in Phoebe Putney, and and again, we had this discussion. Angie and I and Melissa and our team rolled up our sleeves, and we started trying to figure out how to put this together. And that's what I'll share with you now. Um, so, all students. So, this is our 2021 plan after meeting with Tracy uh, of how we would come together. The colors represent. Uh, the school, the school year. So what we've done with our pathway here, and the students start with us in the ninth grade, and we focus a year long on professional and soft skills. So they rotate with instructors during that period. They're with an English instructor for a fourth of the year, learning about email and verbal and written communications. They're with a professional skills coach for a fourth of the year where they're learning about work ethic and showing up on time and cell phones and dress. We even have a handshake competition that takes place during this. It changed our culture. Handshake competition totally changed our culture here. We, we're a fourth of the time they're with a, person, a math instructor. They're doing the Dave Ramsey personal finance course. And then the, the second or the last 25% of the year, they are uh, doing U Science, which you may be familiar with. So they go through the U Science survey tool that looks at their aptitudes and their interests. The teacher helps them figure out. They don't just get the data and have to go read it. The teacher takes them through that process, helps them pick the pathway that's best suited for them. And then we also do pathway exploration during that ninth grade year, and we have guest speakers and a variety of different things. So that's what we do in the ninth grade. They also take some core high school academics while they're here. In the 10th grade year, Dr. Wall, they do their CTA pathway. So, the, and these students have to go to work. So, uh, uh, y'all go clock in. Um, <laughs> work hard, that's right. Thank y'all for being here. Um, so in the 10th grade, they do their complete CTA pathway. We have them here for half a day. So both blocks, while they're here, they're going through their CTA pathway. Nurse Clark and our other team are, are teaching them and they are focusing heavily on empathy and those professional it's almost like a weed out uh, year for them to make sure that health care is right for them um, you know I had a parent uh, talk to me the other day that said that she was at her wits end with our instructor <laughs> the parent and the, 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 the child and now they're on the Christmas card list with nurse Clark because they, <laughs> literally they can't thank her enough it has set her child on a different path different trajectory and guess what mama learned something as well so we do our CTA pathway in the 10th grade in the 11th grade that's when these students get that certified nursing assistant okay so with all of our instructors are duly credentialed with Albany Technical College so they're here in this building they're getting their CNA during that 10th grade year including their rotations at Phoebe Putney for clinical rotation. So that, that's taking place in that 10th, uh, 11th grade year, excuse me, 11th grade year. We want them to be able to, before they leave their junior year, to sit for that exam, that CNA exam. So we don't want to wait over the summer and all that and 100% uh, pass rate with our students in this past year's class, which is an exceptional pass rate that we're very proud of. <laughs> Hats off to you, Nurse Clark. Um, 
So again, Albany Tech, they, the, the CNN pathway is nine hours. It takes, Albany Technical College is on an accelerated program, so they can get that CNA in nine hours. Uh, in the uh, 11th and 12th grade year, they're doing their dual enrollment. So these students that are back here, they want to go into college. Their goal is RN, BSN, maybe even beyond. So that's very important for them. So they do their dual enrollment in the 11th and 12th grade. They can do it either at Albany State University or Albany Tech. We have about half at each. So we've got a lot of flexibility here. Our, our academic instructors are duly credentialed at both places. And then that frees up that 12th grade year for these students to, rather than come to school in the morning, they're clocking in at 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the morning, working alongside other CNAs, working alongside other nurses, doctors, real world. That's where the education is really happening. I talked to some of these kids. Jay, and you had a code right while you were there, like the first couple of weeks that you were there. You had to figure out how to react to that, and they, they really get pulled in. This, this internship, to me, is essential. This is where they're really getting that experience, and they're able to, to, to become workforce ready. Uh, and so this is the plan that we laid out, and, and then I'm going to, Ms. Gardner's got the, what we did here is she then translated this into a schedule that parents and counselors could understand. So a little bit of an eye chart, but you have it in your, in your packet. So Angie? So as we begin to look at um, the importance, of course, for students is that, Ms. Gardner, we don't want to do double work. We want to get the greatest gain for the greatest benefit because we do want to have a life outside of school. So we mapped out the things that were necessary. And the most important thing is that we, in, a, in order for you to get to work, you first have to complete your high school diploma. So let's look at the things that are required for you by your high school and let's plug those in. But let's also look at how dual enrollment can help impact that. Where you can do things on the dual enrollment side that will also give you the satisfaction on your high school side. And so in ninth and 10th grade, of course, they're doing their um, pathways and they're doing their, um, their academics. But as we got to the 11th grade, we realized we wanted the students to complete the CNA certification. So we had to start there. And if we started there, um, they would continue to take some of their core, which was important to them and their parents, because parents, that was a challenge to us. They said, well, if you start taking your CNA courses, where does that leave you with the 30 hours and the core academics that you need? And so we began to plug them in to make sure that they would get the, um, the benefit of, you know, the best benefit that they could gain. Yeah, and so this, just to sh make sure the people in the back, we've got up here on the left, that's the path if you go the Albany Technical College route, and then we also had one uh, for Albany State University as well. So then I'll set this up, Angie, and then you and I will talk through it. So pre, again, pre-Senate Bill 86, the HOPE Career Grant, um, as Irene mentioned, is available for students for approved technical uh, courses once the student reaches their 30-hour cap, okay? So what were our options? With that in mind, and remember my, my arrow chart, if we want to achieve that goal, what are our options for achieving that goal? So we'll start with, with option one. And this is use dual enrollment for technical courses. Okay. So option one was for dual enrollment students through the technical courses to take the 21 hours of the academics, and then they still had the nine hours um, left for the CNA courses. Okay. So barriers with option one. The impact, the negative impact of that was that they would lose nine hours of academic coursework. That would, could also satisfy high school courses and the college courses, the academic college courses. And just, you, you, I remember hearing your conversations with parents that are saying, hey, I want my child to maximize their dual enrollment with that academic core. Yes, and it was, it was, it came to the decision of if my student was going to be in the program or not. And so I went to Mr. Hatcher, I was like, um, I'm trying to explain the importance of what the value that they're going to get of going through the health care program, but the parents are saying to me, I understand, but I would like for them to um, get the gain from the academic side. Yeah, so right. that was one of the greatest barriers. And then the other barrier uh, was, uh, I look at Tracy, I mean, her goal uh, is to get these students into that ASN that, to that RN as quickly as possible. So the other barrier is if you take nine hours of academic core away to do the CNA, 
then now they're at 21 hours for towards their their uh, you know ASN rather than 30. So that's all another semester post high school that they have to take to get that ASN. So those were the two barriers with option one. So now we'll move on to option two, which was to use the HOPE career grant for technical courses. So if you chose the technical side, you could use the um, career grant in order to access those hours. However, if you do that, you still lose uh, you, it, goes, it takes away from the students being able to complete the clinical rotation because we started it in the 11th grade. And so we ran, we, we stumbled upon another barrier that stopped our students from being able to make this option available. That's right. So if you think about this, I can't start my CNA until I finish my 30 hours, which, oh, by the way, is halfway through my senior year, which means I've got the whole spring of my senior year, I'm doing my CNA classes, I haven't taken the exam, I haven't done my clinical rotations, I haven't had a year's worth of internship. So we've got two options, neither one of them allow us to meet Scott and Tracy's goal. Um, so now we shift to last legislative session and, and really before that, what we determined, I came to my network, Mark and uh, Irene and, and others and said, hey, we've got a little bit of a challenge here we determined that using the HOPE career grant for approved technical courses would yield the best options if we could somehow get there, but that would require some policy changes. So what did we do? We started, Irene, why don't you tell us a little bit about our, how we got started through GEAR. First, let me make sure y'all know, yeah. you did a great job by passing Senate Bill 86, but you put a three-year sunset on that because everyone was very concerned about opening up HOPE. And it's a, and again, that's why you're here for us to make sure you clearly understand why this access to the funding matters in decision making. So Senate Bill 86 is awesome. It's making a difference. You're going to see that, but it has a three year sunset. So, and the other thing is we've been at this for going on three years. As, as soon as House Bill 444 passed and we knew that we had these stumbling blocks coming, thank goodness our support from Governor Kemp in this conversation has been very, very good and very supportive. Last year he gave gear money. That's the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funding in order for out of COVID dollars. And that paid for post-secondary side of this equation without changing dual enrollment a year ago. That they didn't feel comfortable about introducing dual enrollment legislation because it was so recent to House Bill 444, but they also recognized we need funding to pay for these courses. So that GEAR funding and the other wonderful thing about the GEAR funding, and Derek is here, can tell you about the technical college getting that, but we are in, um, we've been incentivizing at least 12 to 18 other communities um, doing this exact same type of program. And all of that led to Senate Bill 86. So the beauty of this GEAR funds, all of these students that were back here uh, this morning, they did not have to make that decision on whether or not to use their, their uh, dual enrollment for core or technical. The GEAR funds allowed they just pay technical college for the technical classes. So that took that problem off the table for a year, and that has been tremendously successful. We've got uh, how many different communities? Um, We've got 30 different high schools and career academies that have participated. Um, about almost 1,400 students have taken advantage of this and taken almost 8,000 hours of technical, sorry. Yeah, for our for our online watchers, you're going to need to I'm speak sorry. in the microphone. I think it's on. There we go. Um, so yes, we've served um, almost 30 high school and college and career academy communities throughout the state. Um, Joseph Beckles from my team here has really helped spearhead that from the technical college side. Um, but we had about 1,300 students, almost 1,400 now, that have taken advantage of this program with almost 8,000 credit hours that they've been able to, to use over nine technical college partners, and we've spent about 95% of the grant. Um, I have a sheet that I'll actually hand around. Um, we're waiting on our final fall number to come through, but we expect to expend all the funds by the time fall semester concludes. So we've got a year's worth of data uh, that, to go along with the three-year sort of look in the Senate Bill 86 through the GEAR funds, which is great, and, and we appreciate the governor uh, for, for allowing that to happen. So 
Option two that we shared, using HOPE Career Grant for approved technical courses, that's what we passed with Senate Bill 86, okay? And I want to just crystallize that. So you, heard, you saw our two barriers. Senate Bill 86 removed those barriers, okay? So it allowed, basically allows students, again, you can see in my little diagram here, it was, you, you had to wait till dual enrollment was over to start accessing those uh, career courses. What Senate Bill 86 did is it says, hey, you can access those simultaneous, okay? And uh, 30 hours of dual enrollment for academic core, a HOPE grant for the technical courses. Uh, and, and, and so what that has allowed us to do, and the, the, again, full circle, has allowed us to get qualified students into the workforce sooner. We've got our professional soft skills development. Uh, we've got our high school. So these are what these students will graduate with. Professional soft skills training, CTA pathway completion, Dr. Wall, CNA certification. We've just added this medical assisting coursework that they'll, that they'll have as part of their curriculum. 30 hours of dual enrollment that counts towards their associate's degree, their ASN. One year of an internship as a CNA working in a major employer alongside uh, all sorts of different healthcare providers. Uh, their high school diploma, obviously. They'll only have 30 to 32 hours remaining for their associate's degree to get their RN and have the opportunity to be an RN by the age of 19. Uh, again, if you think about Scott's example, he's 200 R, he's, he's got a paycheck ready for 200 people that have an RN at an average of about $70,000 a year. Just waiting. <laughs> and so, and, and Pam, same with you. So, and let me just share real quick our results. So pre-Senate Bill 86, we had a health care program. We were doing uh, uh, folks going through our CTA pathway. We did not have the CNA opportunity. Gear funds, we had 17 that joined there. For this next cohort, we've got 36. And then our current 10th graders, we have 71 students that are in that pipeline. And that's primarily because of the work you all have done, but also the fact that we've got an incredibly strong partner in Phoebe Putty that's not only willing to put their time and effort over here and to give all these kids experience, but also willing to help the school system fund yet another nursing position, uh, instructor position, uh, to, to solve this problem. So, a lot of information. Uh, we've got a great panel here. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, any questions that anybody might have for us? Yeah, let's let's do some questions for the panelists, and I'll I'll kick us off. Um, going back to that slide, and you don't have to go back to the slide, but where Georgia ranked 49th in in was it nurses per per 1,000? Um, in any any of all of y'all are qualified to answer this, so any of you can have it. Um, what what do you contribute that to? I mean, there's usually and there, there's and as we all know in government, there's, there's, it's not always, or rarely is it one thing. So what are maybe the top three things that you contribute that number being so low? Yeah, well, I'll give you one and let the other members. Yeah, the, the, uh, I had the privilege of serving on the governor's uh, health care workforce task force last summer and uh, summer, fall. One of the things that, w in looking at the, the, the numbers, um, uh, the data was showed that 56% of all nurses that graduate from the university system, and that was just how the data was pulled, but from the university system, stayed in the state. Uh, compared to North Carolina and Texas, where 74% stay. And so I, I don't have an answer for you. That was sort of our post uh, work was uh, to go to the university system and say, we need to figure that out. Why are, why, why are 40, 44% of nurses who graduate from a, a university nursing program leave our state? You know, is it just that we take more uh, students in from other states and they're going home? Is there something driving out? You know, we looked at the at wages. Could it be that? Um, we don't have that answer, but that's a substantial uh, part of, of the miss in the state when you think of other states and why they're successful. 
Yeah, no, I remember the statistic well from the Healthcare Workforce Commission, and it was, you know, you really think Georgia has so much to offer, and, and why would we have such attrition? Uh, and so I think that needs to be looked at even more deeply. As with all things that we look at and you all are, are challenged with uh, looking at, these things are dynamic, multifactorial. There's a lot of contributing factors. And, and I share with providers often that we need to be looking at solutions such as this, but we also have to look inwardly and internally at turnover. Uh, what what is impacting turnover but still foundationally we have to ensure that we are sharing the message creating the pa seamless pathways removing barriers so that we can bring as many expand that pool to the degree that we can uh, there's there's a lot of things that are impacting uh, you know what happens whether they stay or they go once they enter into health care and that profession and and that needs to continue to be looked at and studied uh, because we do have a problem with retention and and I want to own that but um, I, I think that you know that's work that has to go alongside this effort but at the end of the day I think we know that truly what we've got to do is expand the pool and we have to make sure that folks are aware of opportunities. I mean, we do have a, a public relations challenge embedded in this whole piece of ensuring that folks understand what's available to them and then attracting them. And let me just add, I think this program demonstrates solutions, whereas the goal is to keep these students right here in Albany. It is not for them to go off to another college. It is, it is right here, a very seamless path into the workforce, not into post-secondary, into the job because there was a health care partner with them that helped them along the way. And you're going to see that not only here, because they interned with them, they were offered and supported with mentors, their decision making was helped. They, they had the job, knew what their job was at the end. There was no need to leave Albany. This is the greatest place in the world to be. Don't leave. And you're going to see that employer involvement and the importance of work-based learning and internship as students make that path. You're going to see that in this program, and you're going to see that in the manufacturing programs in Coweta County. And one other thing that I think is critically important is that our post-secondary partners work in cooperation together, providing that unbelievably seamless design pathway of, of high school to post-secondary technical credentials or associate degree or a four-year degree. And there's no question about where I go, that path is critically designed for students. So I'll be the one to ask the loaded question from, if, if we take time and money out of your ability to answer here, what is one thing that we as legislators can do, not, not just here locally, of course, but, but Pam, kind of going back to your statistics across the state, what can we do? Taking time and money out of that consideration, is, is there anything that you would offer to us to consider? I'll get started and then, um, you know, Senate Bill 86 is a fantastic start and, and to me it's smart because this is, you know, students are already able to access that HOPE Career Grant so you haven't added anything markedly to your, the expense side of this program. We've just sort of reoriented a little bit. We, we, we adjusted, we removed a barrier and, and you're listening and participating and going through this process is, is step one. Uh, so I, I commend you all on that. Uh, I, I think this is a fantastic, uh, a small adjustment, uh, cost-effective, smart adjustment that you've made that's going to have, already is having uh, impact. But that's my thoughts. Yeah, I, I, you know, no, no one solution, right? It's going to be programs like this that are going to add up. Uh, but if uh, I remember we were sitting uh, in, in Atlanta uh, advocating for more resources for technical colleges in the university system. You're not going to find hospitals many times say, would you please give more money to somebody else and not us? Uh, 
but in this case, I think it's going to uh, our, our schools and saying, what do you need? They need to be more, they need to uh, be able to uh, bring more faculty on in a competitive way. It, it, it's, it's hard when the faculty who are nurses themselves can go travel and make you know, one and a half or two times the amount of money, and I, nobody blames them. It's hard to get them back and hard to get them into faculty positions. So how do we go to the deans and, and the, the college presidents and say, how, how can you be more competitive in your faculty? Because we can have all the, the interest in the world if we don't have teachers to teach them, right? They, the programs shrink, and then our, our, our statistics go down. So how to, you know, how do we, uh, you know, I, I always thought, of, this is, I still say it, I, I've said this to Chancellor Purdue, so uh, he does know, I, I said, you know, how does the university system double the number of nursing slots that they have today, right? I mean, there's a lot of nurses that get turned away because, uh, or, or students, because there's not a slot. Uh, and, and so, you know, is there a way to incentivize our colleges and our technical colleges and universities to take on more, more nursing, uh, uh, no more healthcare positions? And I would just add, you know, being willing to uh, think about things differently. We recognize that as you know, time goes along, how we operate today is not how we operated 30 years ago or maybe when the nurse aid training program state requirements and rules were written. So when we come and say there's just an inherent barrier built into the way that things are now, being willing to say, you know, let's get that out of the way. Let's figure out a way to, uh, you know, now we're working with the University of Georgia on a remote skills evaluation process. So the uh, nurse aid students have to go through a written uh, certification exam to get their state certification, but they also have to go through a skills evaluation process. And they had to, in some cases, o over the course of the pandemic, they were traveling four and five hours to get that done. And uh, that's just really not realistic for where they are in life and resource, et cetera. And so we're piloting a, uh, a program with the University of Georgia where the, that skills evaluation is conducted and proctored uh, virtually and uh, had a great uh, launch recently. And so it's that sort of thing that we've got to be willing to entertain and think about and do differently because the, the healthcare system as a whole and the way we deliver service looks different now. Let me add to your question, but make sure you challenge local communities on how they're using the investments that you're already making. And that is, you heard through this program, you, their faculty is certified by the technical college as well as Albany State. So the funding that you sent down for a, a CTAE Albany, Albany Darty County Schools to pay for got additional funding. So that's make sure that those funds are coming together in the most efficient and effective way possible. That's a critical, there's not enough money to keep everybody in silos. But when a community is incentivized to do what they're doing here in partnership, that's when you get the biggest bang for the buck that you're investing. Thank you. Uh, any committee members? Yep, Senator Perrin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you so much for these um, informative presentations. I, what I, one of the things that really strikes me and that I really like about the work that's been done here is how um, coordinated and integrated it is with major employer, with um, employee need, workforce shortage, working with the school system, the university system, technical system, and of course, um, you guys here at the College and Career Academy. And so as we sort of move through the study committee process, I'm wondering how many of our other College and Career Academies at the current time have such a sort of integrated and coordinated pipeline with one or more large employers right in that region where the path is, is very clear and can flow um, without sort of any major impediments. A lot of them. We need to, a lot of them do? Yes. 
a lot of. I mean, we, we thanks to the GEAR funding and the Technical College leadership, those communities that that got kick-started, we went around and, and Phoebe has done a great job of convincing all other health systems that there's, go, go find kids at the high school level. And a lot of school, a lot of businesses are opening up the doors to 16 and 17 year olds. We've been talking about increasing work-based learning forever and how important that is. And this is just the, that idea on steroids. So there's so many pieces of this puzzle that are in place that you guys are already funding, but the, the but issues like this is kind of a no-brainer. But the, the, the thing about Senate Bill 86, when you decide to make that permanent, which honestly is our ask, we hope that you do, um, it is to ensure that you are incentivizing this as opposed to going back where students are just picking and choosing whatever dual enrollment programs they want. That's not what we're trying to create. We are trying to create these types of programs that are high, high demand, high skill, high wage programs that lead people directly into a job in their region. And Senator, I'll just add, um, you know, this structure is, is conducive for the College and Career Academy structure is conducive for the problem that you just, I mean, my job is to partner with our, whether it's Phoebe Putney or Procter & Gamble or the Marine Corps Logistics Base or whoever, all of them have got challenges. So I'm able uh, to go out and figure out what those challenges, come back to a, a seasoned educator, because I'm not one, and sit down and have a conversation about, hey, this is what they need. The, you know, and have have a school system that's willing to sort of roll up their sleeves and not they say no, that's the way we, we can't do it. That you know, it takes all of that working together in in a school system that says, you know, we're going to fund fifty percent if the ho if, if the hospital's willing to put in fifty percent for instructor. Why why wouldn't we? You know, that's too, you know. So it it, it takes leadership. Uh, at, at the, with the business community, with the school system, uh, and, and we're blessed down here that, that we've got that. And so um, I'm hopeful that others uh, in other communities, I know in Noonan, uh, I know at uh, Golden Isles, they they're, they're have the same local uh, input. Any other committee members got any questions? Yeah. Thank you. If I could add uh, one more question, and you can be brief. The uh, internship, I think uh, that's one of the most important things you do. Can you just kind of comment about how that affects the kids positively? And Because uh, from what I understand, you're gonna, they're going to have to go through the same rules, regulations as your full-time staff. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it took adjustments in our workforce. You know, when we were first setting it up, we had um, – we were very particular about the units and the floors that we started the interns in. We didn't, we really wanted to make sure it was a positive environment. We didn't, we kind of wanted to, you know, put our arms around them a little bit and make sure they were having a good experience, right? Um, so that was one of the things. Um, you know, one of the things that some might say was a challenge, but um, when we first started, we had um, a death um, of a patient and one of the interns had that experience and it was very disturbing and upsetting and they ended up deciding not to go into health care. Um, I don't see that as a bad thing. Um, not everybody needs to be in health care and that is something that you're going to have to experience and I see that as that student was able to make choices earlier on that maybe this isn't the career that I want to go into. So, uh, but, but overall, it's been positive. Um, we've had some great, you know, our patients love having them, our staff love having them. Um, I really wish we would have asked one of them about, about that because um, I think they could share uh, more probably than me. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just say this, Rick. So whenever Tracy laid all that out and said this is what our needs are and we talked about an internship, I said, look, this needs to be a paid internship. I said, we've got students. We need the, the value exchange is important uh, because they could go work somewhere else to make money and, and miss out on the chance. And so uh, just to further crystallize our partnership with Phoebe Putney, uh, we've, we have an MOU with them. $75,000 a year goes into this program, and about 75% of that is the internship program. 
So that's the key. So they're they're getting experience. They're making money, and uh, and they're they're learning to to put all of those skills into play. That's great. Thank you. You can tell where all the politicians are sitting and where our citizen appointees are sitting because we're the ones grabbing the microphone. Um, all right, so any, do y'all have any questions? Scott, do you have a question for yourself? Um, well, y'all give our panelists a big round of applause, please. And thank you, Chris, for leading that discussion. That was uh, very informative. So. At this time, we'll, we'll go into the public comments, and we are running a little behind, so just uh, try to keep them a little bit brief. Um, so first up, we got uh, Emmett Griswold with Albany Tech. Uh, yeah, actually, why don't we just come right up to the podium? You got a microphone right there for you. Well, I signed in because I thought it was a sign-in sheet. I didn't know it was, <laughs> I didn't know it was a, a, a speaking, but, but I'll go ahead since you called me. But I just want to uh, reiterate what Scott uh, said about the, what, what the legislation could do for, for, for us if, if you had a question. And it is funding for, for faculty. Uh, the two key variables of any type of school or college is the student and the faculty. So if you don't have those, then you don't have a, a school or college. So again, funding for, for faculty to, for those positions is uh, extremely important, essential, because again, we can, we can add slots and add more nursing slots for students, but we've got to have the faculty in order to meet those ratios for student, you know, student to faculty ratios. So again, I'll just add that, that point. Thank you very much. Joseph Eccles from TCSG. <laughs> you, you, just, you just follow his lead, right? I like that. Uh, Sarah Brentson from ASC. <laughs> Sorry for our friends who are watching. We're, you're being broadcast live in 97 countries and 23 languages, so. I can just kind of add to what Dr. Griswold said earlier. Um, because we are a small rural community, and there are a lot of communities in Georgia that are the same, we end up com competing for the same faculty, competing for the same nursing workforce. As you can tell, Tracy Suber, Dr. Suber is wonderful. She left Albany State to go work for Phoebe. And we go back and forth in that direction. And a lot of our faculty members decide to go back into the healthcare workforce because the pay is better. So they are competing for their family needs in the workforce as well. And so just finding a more competitive salary for our nursing faculty. Um, for those of you who do not know, our Georgia Board of Nursing has a faculty to student ratio in our classrooms. So we have to meet that ratio. Albany State turned away over 60 students this semester because we do not have enough faculty in our ASM program. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that point home and putting it in a real world numbers perspective. Lisa Stevens. She was behind me today. <laughs> Did anybody come in not behind Dr. Griswold that would like to speak? Um, well, all right, so uh, great testimony today, great panelists. Thank you all again for, um, for doing that. And, and Chris and Angie, we appreciate you all hosting us here at, at 4C. It's a beautiful facility. Uh, we're actually going to do a tour. We're going to go a little bit out of order on the agenda. I'm gonna, we're going to adjourn first, and then, and then whoever would like to do the tour um, will do that. And so... Um, we figure we better do that out of order because if we leave here, we may not be able to get anybody back for an adjournment. So, uh, so we'll do that. We'll do uh, for our panel, or I'm sorry, for our committee members. Um, there is a we got a little lunch for you. Um, if you need to go, that's fine. You can grab it and go. And uh, again, thank you all for being here, and uh, just uh, proud to see the work y'all are doing. And you know, one of the 
one of the key words I think that you you see here and then really you see throughout the state in our college and career academies and that word is partnership. You know, when, when the private sector and the public sector come together to find solutions, um, it, you, it truly works. Um, and we, we figure it out. And so um, this is just a, a great example of that and uh, look forward to seeing the continued success and, and whatever we can do as, as policymakers to uh, whether it be removing roadblocks like we did in SB 86. Um, these are the things we need to know, we need to see, uh, and we got to see that today. So again, thank you all. Um, uh, Co-Chairman Dubnik, do you want to? Um, so I, I hope that you're all on the email list and you're getting updates on, on our meetings. And so we've got three more. As we said, we'll be in less than two weeks. We'll be in Coweta County. So if anybody's not getting those emails, come see us. We'll take care of that. And unless there's anything else for the good of the order. Real quick, for lunch, we have lunch for our, our panel and staff. And it'll be, they'll bring it right back in here at the table. Uh, so when we come back from the tour, it'll be here for you. <laughs> got 250 miles. We appreciate the box lunch. If nothing else, we'll stand adjourned.